When we think of the number one critter that is the most useful to a gardener, we often think of worms. But what if I told you that worms are not native to North America? Yeah, they're an invasive species. And yes, many of them can blend in just fine and actually do provide substantial benefits for the world of agriculture. Not so much to ecosystems, but to agriculture, yes. But there's a new kid on the block, and he's drilling holes, as Captain Jack Sparrow would say. Stop blowing holes in my ship! In this case, your garden. So if you don't know who I am, hi, hello, my name is Ashley, and I have a bachelor's of science in soil science. I've been working in the world of agriculture for nearly 15 years, I like to take plant and soil science and apply it to our garden. And in today's video, we are going to jump in, dig deep to discuss the Asian jumping worm. I did two. That was two funnies in one sentence. That was good. That was a good one. Off the top of the noggin. Off the top of the noggin. So first, let's look at the big picture and my statement about how worms in general are not native to North America. Approximately 12,000 years ago, there was a giant block of ice rolling across Earth's surface. And prior to that, all of North America, or most of North America, was bedrock. Now, what this giant ice cube did was it crushed that bedrock and made a fine powder. This fine powder is what we call soil. That's why when I say mineral soil versus organic soil, what I'm speaking to is Mineral soil is literal bedrock that has been pulverized by a very heavy piece of ice. Now, because of that, obviously there were no earthworms when it was just bedrock. Furthermore, there weren't any earthworms when there was a giant block of ice weighing the entire thing down. And therefore, a lot of our ecosystems actually developed without earthworms present. The good guys and the bad guys included. So here's the thing. While the Europeans colonized the Americas, Earthworms colonized the soil of the Americas. Yes, the nightcrawler, as we call it, was brought over by Europeans because they knew how valuable they were in the garden. I know, that's crazy, right? But that's how they helped to make their soils more productive in spaces where they thought this isn't working. Now, obviously, when these were brought over for gardens and agriculture, it helped to feed the population that was here in North America. However, they then moved and multiplied into ecosystems. And like I said, these ecosystems were formed without earthworms present, which means earthworms, even the good guys, actually do eat a number of seeds and actually really disrupt the natural cycle of decomposition and rejuvenation of the boreal forest, for example. The Great Plains is another. Now, obviously, as gardeners, there's not much we can do here because they are quite literally everywhere at this point, and they are incredibly beneficial to our vegetable gardens, our flower gardens, our perennials, you name it. But there is one of them that is also multiplying and moving its way into your area, regardless of how cold you are. Worms will just go down. They just go down. They go down into the depths and then they come back up when it gets warm. They know where to go when the frost hits. Let's just say that. And that is the Asian jumping worm. Now, Asian jumping worms look identical to other worms. It isn't until you pick them up and put them in the palm of your hand and they start thrashing around like a freaking fish out of water that you then realize it is an Asian jumping worm. Now, when it comes to ecosystems, these bad boys can and will destroy an entire boreal forest within one season. And the way that they do this within one season is literally by eating the forest floor two to three times faster than just a regular earthworm. Now, you're probably thinking, why does this matter? Well, it matters because it eats the seeds and then it actually deposits their manure onto the soil surface. And the microbes within the soil are not meant to take that big of an influx when it comes to nutrients. This means the nutrients that was slotted to be used for the next five, six, seven years has been officially washed away because the microbes can't use it, the plants can't use it fast enough, and there's nothing else that can uptake this stuff. So it washes into your waterways, your rivers, ponds, you name it. And we know this because the University of Wisconsin in 2014 looked at exactly this, specifically forest scenarios. As a gardener, you're probably thinking, okay, why does this matter? Why do I care? It's not eating your live plants, no. But what it is doing is it is leaving behind a dry, 
coffee ground type textured deposit, which is their poo. Now, this is drastically different than vermicast. And this poo being dry and clumpy can actually cause a matting effect where water can't get through. It looks kind of crusty. And overall, it's just not a good thing. So before we get into how to get rid of these bad boys or how to prevent them from ever getting into your garden in the first place, because no offense, once they're here, there, good luck to you, geek. You're screwed. You're still part of the geek crew, but you're screwed. Anyways, what we're looking for is that coffee ground like poo on the soil surface. That's indicator number one. Indicator number two is when you pull the worm out and it thrashes around like a crazy person. Worms, night crawlers, the good guys, the good guys that are still in day, so keep that in mind. That's an indicator. And number three is actually that little band that you see on worms. Well, European have a raised thingy. Killian? Citalium? What is it called? I can't even remember what it's called. It's called something, but it's like a band and it's raised. Asian jumping worms, it is level. It is like it's there. You can see it. It's like a creamy, milky, white looking thing, but it's not. There's no bump. It's just a thing there. What is that thing for even? I don't know. I'm not a worm person. Let's just say that. Snakes now. That is a different story. If you know what I'm saying. I actually had a corn snake as a kid, as a pet. Well, actually, no, it wasn't mine. It was my brother's and I inherited it because my brother decided he didn't actually want it. Long story short, I had one. Okay. So number one, prevention. Prevention is the key. Think of these worms as the equivalent to glitter. Once you get glitter anywhere, it is there forever. And it just seems to keep on multiplying despite everything you do to try to get rid of it. Now, the way that it arrives is sadly enough through things like compost, manures, bag soils, starts from the greenhouse, tools that may be from areas that it has been used in, and so here's the thing. If you know Asian jumping worms are in your area, do not buy used garden equipment. Renting that tiller may not be worth it if you know Asian jumping worms are an issue in your area. Now, if you're in an area where there is no Asian jumping worms yet, then obviously you can trade equipment very easily. You just want to make sure you disinfect it properly. But when it comes to the bagged stuff, whatever it is, it does not matter what it is, is it can be compost, manure, peat moss, potting soil. Literally, the list is endless. It can be any of those. If it is, they themselves could be in there, but their actual eggs can be as well. So what you want to do is actually expose this to some sun. Now, I've read we want to aim for somewhere. And the time in which you know they're dead is or cooked is when you put a compost thermometer in and it reads around 131 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but oddly enough, most compost thermometers are in America's numbers, not the rest of the world's numbers. But anyways, 131 degrees Fahrenheit minimum, and that has to be held for at least two to three days. It can be held for longer if needed. There's no such thing as too much. Now, of course, when it comes to starts from the actual greenhouse, there isn't much you can do to make sure that they aren't present. I guess you could try to knock off some of that soil. But the question I would ask the nursery or the greenhouse is what precautions are you using to make sure that your potting soil, your compost, your manures are free from Asian jumping worms and or their eggs? And if the answer is we heat this baby up, before we put it in any nursery pot, then you're okay. If that's not the case, and you know there's Asian jumping worms in your area, it may be something to consider. And that sounds crazy to me, but you may not be able to get nursery or greenhouse plants successfully without them being introduced. Okay, save did find them in your garden. And now you're like, okay, how do I get rid of them? Or maybe you haven't found them yet, but you wanna draw them out. Number one is actually mustard. Sounds insane, but it's true. So with one gallon of water, you're going to mix a third to half a cup of mustard seeds. You want to stir that all up, let it sit for a little while so that water can get a little spicy, and then you're going to throw it onto the garden. Now, you can't like put, obviously, you have to do this in little batches because the idea here is that the water is going to go through the soil profile via gravity. 
and it's going to eventually hit said worms. So we want to do little patches at a time, and that will then shoot said worms to the surface of the soil. And then you can collect them, look at them, figure out what kind of worm it is, and if there are any Asian jumping worms, but and then start working on these next steps. Solarization. So solarization is something I continually go back to because it is helpful in killing everything, beneficials and harmfuls. But if you're in a pickle, maybe something you need to consider. Now you want to solarize the soil. And this, keep in mind, is only temporary in the sense that it will solarize a raised bed for a period of time. But if said raised bed is attached to the earth, eventually they will make it into that raised bed. An in-ground bed, it's even more difficult because unless you're solarizing an incredibly large space, they can and will make it back into your garden. Obviously, if we're talking potting soils or container gardens, we're in the clear. This is incredibly easy to manage because it's not they're not going to recall it by any stretch of the imagination. Now, the rest of the methods are kind of fringe and they're not heavily agreed upon as actual ways to deal with these bad boys. So chickens and ducks, for example, typically, yes, they will eat them, but they can't eat them fast enough to be able to put an actual dent in the population. And then the other methods can include a very specific type of fungi, and I'll put the name up here as to what it is. And this has been shown to possibly be able to take out this issue. And then the other one is tea seed meal has also been shown. But again, very fringe, not completely agreed upon. So remover, manual removal and heat are going to be your best too. So gate crew, you have to let me know in the comments down below where you're from and if you have Asian jumping worms and what you've done to try to get rid of them. Or if you are from a specific area, you're concerned about Asian jumping worms because you know they're in that area and how you prevent them from actually making their way into your garden. And gate crews who have no idea this was even an issue. Now you know to be careful with certain stuff. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.